Yeah, firstly, uh, thanks to the NBCO for inviting me here today to talk about Part M and particular dispensations and existing buildings. Now, uh, full disclosure, uh, I am a Martin Ryan uh, disciple or a minion, as I've been learned learn, learn this morning, So, or I was, I should say. Um, I hung up those uh, the blue dungarees and I flew the coop back in 2018, back to my native Tipperary. So, uh, well, no, my, my start, I suppose, in, in the public sector was under under Martin Rice tutelage. So, some of this is probably going to sh show through here in this in this presentation. So, in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to do a quick pop quiz because I know I've kind of got the graveyard shift after lunch, and I'm trying to keep you all awake and engaged. And I'll do my best in that. So, we'll have a quick kind of pop quiz that's um, going to go up on Slido. So, I'd ask you all maybe just log in. There's a QR code there on your uh, on your timetables to to see that, right? But what I'm going to talk about is what actually is a dispensation or a relaxation. What, what what are we talking about when a consultant says, I want to apply for one? Or what are we talking about when the Building Control Authority are either granting or refusing one? Okay, We'll look at the requirements of, uh, of Part M, M1 to M2, M3, so on and so forth. We'll quickly look through kind of prima facie compliance and the role of the technical guidance documents in complying with the requirements. Uh, we'll look at the kind of confusion that sometimes arises around requirements versus the guidance and which is which and where do I actually comply, okay? There's a very good cir circular that was brought out in 1992, Building Control Circular. I'm going to talk through, through that and how that feeds into uh, dispensations and relaxations. I have a quick review of the dispensations that were granted between 2021 and 2022. So over the last two years, I've done a very quick kind of synopsis of the types of dispensations that have been applied for and that have been granted. And we'll just tease out um, some of them, uh, in particular, the more kind of common topics that, that, that tend to arise. We'll then kind of look at uh, existing buildings. And it's come up this morning already that, you know, Section 2 should not be used as a default to, for existing buildings that you tell me you can comply and you give me very particular, very clear uh, outline information as to where you can't follow the guidance to the letter of the law. What can we live with? Where can we meet a, meet a compromise? And what can we determine to be adequate? Okay. So we'll look at some kind of existing entrances, corridors, stairs, toilets, things like that, where existing buildings can kind of throw up some, some, some bumps in the road um, that we need to, need to come over. Then we'll just finish up then with a, a very quick kind of pop quiz take two and see if I've changed a few, uh, a few attitudes in the room and online. So to start off, and it's on Slido, unfortunately I can't bring it up on the screen, so I just have it here in front of my phone. Uh, small office building with two rooms upstairs, say a maximum occupancy of 10 people. So it's an existing building. So genuinely, genuinely and for a good reason, the stairs cannot provide a 1200 mil width as per paragraph 1343A of 10 guys document M 2010. At best, there's only 900 mil, all right? So we have four options. Uh, we can apply for a dispensation from paragraph 1343A. We can apply for a dispensation from part M. We can apply for a relaxation from part M, or we could deal with the issue as part of the DAC application. So I just ask you all maybe just to, to uh, fill out the poll online and we'll kind of get a, a rough idea as to where we are in the room. So I'm seeing on my phone there now, there's about 77% are saying deal with an issue as part of the DAC process. Yeah, okay, I don't have to convert too many people, that's good. Um, fifteen percent or saying to apply for a dispensation from the par from paragraph one three four three, four percent apply for relaxation for part M, and no one is looking for a dispensation from part M. Liars, someone lying out there. Um, right. So when we talk about dispensing a regulation or relaxing a requirement, or sorry, a, reg a regulation, what, when we're talking about dispensations or relaxations, what are we actually talking about? Um, when we apply for a dispensation, what what are we applying for? What, what, what are we relaxing exactly? So section four of the Building Control Act is the first primary piece of legislation that dispensations start cropping up in and relaxations. So if you go to section four, it will tell you that subject to provisions of this section, a building control authority may, if it considers it reasonable, having regard to all the circumstances of the case, grant a dispensation from or a relaxation of any requirement of the building regulations. Okay, so the dispensations or relaxations are from the requirements of the building regulations. Okay, so keep that in the, 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 the front of your mind. Similarly, in uh, Article 14 of the building regulations, again, every application for a dispensation from or relaxation of any requirement of these regulations shall be in the form set out. And the application form itself for a dispensation or relaxation, it's asking you what, require, what, what requirement of the building regulations are concerned. And what are we dispensing? So taking you back to first principles, what are actually the requirements of the building regulations? Okay. 
Martin Ryan and, and Owen and, and my earlier speakers talked about, you know, technical guidance documents and all the paragraphs that are there, the 350 par bullet points that are in section one alone. Well, what are the actual first principles? What are the requirements of the regulations? So if you go back to part M1, M1, adequate provision shall be made for people to access and use a building, its facilities and its environs. Um, I've heard the word disability thrown around a lot this morning, and it, 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 I, I have a bugbear with the fact that it's actually called a disability access cert. I think it should be just called an access and use cert or something like that, because the, the, the regs changed in 2010, and we still have this hangover from the part M 2000s that it's adequate provision shall be made for people with disabilities to access and use a building. That's gone. It's for everyone. It's for me. It's for you. It's for the mom or dad with the buggy. It's for the top GA player who did their cruciate and is now on crutches. It doesn't matter. It's for people. So it, it has to be adequate provision shall be made for people. And one thing I'll, I'll say, part M uh, aspect of the design of any building has to be looked at early on. Because regardless of what, what, what goes on, and obviously we need to comply with the other parts of the building regulations, but the use of a building and people will curse the designer for how a building does not work or does not, it isn't usable based on the part M design not being right. Okay. So if doors are swinging out into corridors where they're going to clobber people, all these different aspects need to be looked at very early on and designed out early. Think about the usability of the building. Try and take the word disability out of the back of your mind. It's, it's not just for the wheelchair users. It's not just for, it's for everyone. Okay. For you, me, for everyone. Okay. So it, going back to what I said, the requirement is adequate provision shall be made for people to access and use a building, its facilities and environments. All right. That's the requirement. That's what the regulations are made up of. There are the gray boxes within the technical guidance documents, but don't confuse the regulations versus the guidance. That guidance document there is a guidance document to, to, to you know, demonstrate compliance with, with the requirement or with the regulation, but that's the requirements there. So it's the building control authority's job and it's the consultant's job to prove compliance with that regulation. Going back to the guidance, so if I've kind of said that the technical guidance documents aren't the regulations, which they're not, they're guidance documents, okay? What's their purpose? They are there to show you a method of complying with the regulation, all right? They are not the only method, as Owen had, uh, Owen O'Hurley talked about earlier. They are, you know, there's universal design, there's BSA 300, there's all these other guidance documents out there that are out there. TGD uh, M is just, it, it's quite handy for us. It's, it's, it's local to, to, to our environment, but it will prove prima facie compliance with the requirements. But going back to it, that's still the requirement. Not that the corridor has to be 1200 mil wide. The building has to have adequate provision for people to access and use the building, okay? So just the, the very first paragraph in every technical guidance document make, makes reference to this. And it says that where works are carried out in accordance with the guidance in this document, this will prima facie indicate compliance with part M or whatever part of the regulation is. So compliance on the face of it, effectively, okay? However, the adoption of an approach other than that outlined in the guidance is not precluded, provided that the relevant requirements of the regulations are complied with. That's where people kind of get a little bit pent up sometimes. Sometimes we have to use alternative approaches. Sometimes we need a bit of professional judgment and compensatory features, especially to make existing buildings work. And I'll talk about some uh, compensating measures that can be implemented in existing buildings a little bit later on. But ultimately the building control authority have to be in a position where they can establish that the requirements of the building regulations are being complied with. So that's the idea behind the DAC process, that we don't treat it as a paperwork exercise. It has to give us very clear detail in order for us to certify the design. Um, and again, going back to what the requirements are, so paragraph 0 0.2 of Tent Guidance Document M will very clearly outline that to satisfy the requirements part of this is probably the best guidance in, in the whole document, if I'm honest, and it's at the very start. Because it will tell you that in order to satisfy the requirements of part M, all buildings should be designed and constructed so that people can safely and independently approach, gain access, and use a building, its facilities, and its environs. And elements of the building do not constitute an undue hazard for people, especially for people with vision, hearing, or mobility impairments. All right. But again, going back to my requirements, the technical guidance documents are not the regulations. They're just guidance documents. So again, talking through requirement versus guidance. Requirement M1, adequate provision shall be made for people to access and use a building, its facilities, and its environs. Whereas the guidance from TGDM will tell you that the minimum clear width between walls, upstands, or curbs should be 1,500 mil. All right? That's not always possible, particularly with existing buildings. 
if we had an existing gently sloped access route that's 950 mil wide due to the site constraints, like what do we do? Do we look for a dispensation from requirement M1? Or could we handle that through the DAC process, through providing very clear particular information as to why the site constraints are that way, why it can't be upgraded, and is that adequate for the amount of people and the type of facility that's being provided? Okay. But we can handle it through the DAC process. It can all be handled that way. And at the end, Martin Ryan alluded to it as well, you get a nice certified design, best comfort blanket any designer could ask for, that they have a certified design to, to part M. Um, so we all know the building regulations were published and implemented in uh, the, the 1st of June 1992. Shortly after that, there was a building control circular that was passed around to all the building control authorities that, uh, appointed at that time. Okay, That circular was drafted by the same people that drafted the building regulations. So they kind of knew what they were talking about when they, when they, when they issued this, this, this document. Um, I believe the NBCO have a copy of that. So if anyone in the room wants it, just to reach out to the guys or I can email it on afterwards as well. We can maybe even send it out with the, with the, with the slides. Fantastic document to go through. But I'll just very quickly kind of cover the dispensations and relaxation section of that. Okay. So prior to 1992, we all know from 19, after 1981, Stardust fire happened. Some of the recommendations that came out of that inquiry were for proper building standards. And it took 10 years to kind of uh, claw and drag and get them through. Okay. They were initially kind of envisaged as very prescriptive regulations. So the building regulations would tell you exactly that you have to build a wall with two 100 mil leaves of masonry and a 50 mil cavity in between or something like that. Whereas what was actually enacted were much more functional requirements or non-prescriptive. So instead it will tell you that, you know, a building shall be so designed to limit moisture uh, penetration through the, through the walls and floors and, and roofs. Okay. Much more, I suppose, broad in terms of how you can comply with that. Um, and, and what kind of hung over, I suppose, from the initial uh, in regulations when they're envisaged as a prescriptive form was the dispensations and relaxations. Okay. Realistically, you'll see even in here, the uh, redrafting of the regulations into functional requirements in general terms and support by the technical guidance documents has radically altered the manner in which section four of the act will operate. Remember section four covers dispensations and relaxations. Uh, and it should be very clearly noted that the power in the act relating to relaxations and dispensations applies only to the requirements of the regulations does not extend to the technical guidance documents. So you cannot apply for a dispensation from the corridor with having to be 1200 mil. That's not what it's for. Okay. Going back to, if, if, you're, if, if you grant a dispensation or you, you relax a requirement of the building regulations or you apply for one, what are you applying for? You're, you're, you're theoretically looking to provide inadequate access and use of a building. So remember, our requirement is adequate access and use. If we, if, we, if we applied for a dispensation from part M1, theoretically, its adequate provision does not have to be met for people to access and use building its facilities and environment. So where does that leave us? Is it kind of carte blanche that the building can do whatever it has to do, that doors can swing whatever way, that the ramp can be one and two? Um, again, going back to that uh, circular, you see that it said that the regulations normally imply such words as reasonable, adequate, or necessary. And it, it very clearly outlines in the circular that it would make little sense to relax a requirement to something which is less than reasonable, adequate, or necessary. Uh, these terms and their very nature imply different levels of performance in relation to different buildings. So by definition, if you apply for a dispensation or relaxation from the building regulations, you're looking for a dispensation from adequate, reasonable, necessary. It doesn't make sense, does it? You're, you're, you're looking for something that's inadequate. So there's questions as to whether dispensations should be granted at all. Now, look, there are certain regulations that maybe you could, because there are the majority of our regulations are functional and non-prescriptive. But you take regulation 8 there, 80 from part L 2022, 20, uh, that requires that new boilers put in are 90% efficient. You could relax that if you want. I don't know why you would want to, but you could relax it to maybe 80% because it's, you know, it's written in terms of a, a, a prescriptive regulation as opposed to a non-prescriptive where it's adequate, reasonable, or necessary. So over the last two years, I did a quick review of dispensations that were applied for and that were granted. And I just want to run through them with you and hopefully I can change a few mindsets in terms of why dispensations should, should, should be applied for or, or should they even be applied for or granted. So 
by type over the last two years, there were four dispensations from part B, which again is quite strange because if we go through B1 to B6, it's it or B1, B1 to B5, I should say, I suppose, uh, it's adequate means of escape, you know, things like that. So are you saying that now has to be inadequate means of escape? Part M has 145 dispensations applied for and granted. Part L, 34, and Part K, 2. So just from those stats alone, you can see that part M of the regulations is being treated very differently to the other requirements of the building regulations. Um, personally, I think it might still be the fact that we have this hangover from part M 2000, whereby we still have it in our brain that it's, it's access and facilities for people with disabilities. It's not. So some of the commonly requested dispensations, staff use only. I only have staff use in this building. What about adequate provision for the staff members? You know, it's often the case that the, the staff entrance isn't, co isn't covered in the, the DAC. Why? Do they not deserve vision panels? Do they not have, should, should they not have ironmongery? That's right. Uh, very good analogy, I, 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 I've, been, I've been told, is the, uh, you take your pharmaceutical building, and again, Martin Ryan has dealt with many of them in his time, and I've dealt with a few of my time as well. If you have your top scientist there, and he goes away on a skiing holiday and breaks one of his legs, what are you going to do with him? Are you going to leave him at home or could he come in and use the, an office within that building as opposed to applying for a dispensation from part M for that entire building? You know, are there certain areas? This is where it has to come out in the wash, I suppose, with the DAC process as to tell me what you can do. Okay. Don't write, try and write a carte blanche and say, I can't do anything. That's, that's, that shouldn't be the case. The, the, there should be adequate slip resistance. There should be good lighting levels. There should be good color contrast. The iron mongery should be right. Okay. Able-bodied people only. Well, what about adequate provision for able-bodied people? I, I'm just as vulnerable to being struck by an outward opening door than someone in a wheelchair or someone on a walker. Okay, so you you can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that it's 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 able-bodied people only, and you know I don't need to actually comply with Part M. Part M is for everyone. DAC not required. The 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 disability access certificate process is under the building control regulations not the building regulations. Going back to Article 4, or sorry, Section 4 of the, the Building Control Act, the dispensation or relaxation is from any requirement of the building regulations, not the building control regulations, completely se separate se set of regulations. So you can't apply for dispensation from, from, from uh, getting a DAC. It's a temporary building. So unless it's in exempt under Schedule 3 of the building regulations, why can't it comply? You know, is it worth taking the risk, if it, even if it is temporary? Um, a very common one, the existing stairs can't fully comply, so I want to apply for a dispensation from part M1. I don't want to provide adequate, adequate access and, and use of the building effectively is what it's saying in the law. Uh, but can we not upgrade the, the, the stairs insofar as it's practicable? You know, and tell me what is practicable. The rise, the going might not be right, we can't change that. We could add a handrail that's compliant. We could upgrade the slip resistance. We could change color contrasting nosings. We could upgrade the lighting. All these different things are, 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 are possible. And ultimately, it's up to the designer to prove what's adequate, and it's up to the building control authority to determine, is it adequate? What can we certify? I just hark back onto this because I really want to reinforce this point. M1, adequate provision shall be made for people, for people to access and use a building, its facilities and environments. M2, adequate provision shall be made for people to approach and access an extension to a building. And I'll talk about extensions a little bit later on with regards to existing buildings. And M3, if sanitary facilities are provided in a building that is to be extended, adequate sanitary facilities shall be provided for people within the extension. We determine what's adequate. That's what has to happen. But all of the previous examples that I, I gave there that were applied for dispensations, every single one of them could have been dealt with during the disability access certificate process. There's no reason why they couldn't have been. And the designer could have got a certified design at the end. So the entrance is too narrow. That's no reason to omit vision panels on the door. The stairs rises too high. No reason not to provide a compliant handrail or change the, the, the color contrasting nosings to be compliant or upgrade the slip resistance. There's no wheelchair users within the building, another very common one that you come across. What about everyone else? You know, it's not just for the wheelchair users. So don't throw the baby out with the bat water is the main message of my presentation in regards to dispensations. Just because one element can comply doesn't mean we can we we, we don't make everything else uh, as as good as we can and even upgrade the element that can comply to be somewhat reasonably adequate. Now, existing buildings. So 
these, for obvious reasons, probably form the vast majority of dispensations that are applied for because it's very hard to shoehorn an existing building to comply with Section 1 fully, or allegedly it is. Uh, it's the, the first thing I want to say is, I suppose, the, the DAC, it's not a paperwork exercise. Don't treat it as such. Martin Ryan alluded to it earlier, just regurgitating the guidance does not tell me anything about the building. You, you have to tell me what the, 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 the particular information is. Ultimately, the building control authority have to certify the design. We need the particular information of the building, whether it be the good, the bad, or the ugly. We still need to know. There's no point trying to hide things. You may as well get yourself a certified design at the end. Um, the other important aspect here I want to talk about, Section 2 of TGDM, and it's been alluded to already today, it is a fallback for individual elements only. It is not the statutory or the, 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 the default setting, I should say, for existing buildings. So try not to uh, uh, write a, a DAC compliance report from the point of view of Section 2 only. There's no reason to do it because the first paragraph of every uh, every uh, section or every paragraph within Section 2 will tell you that the guidance in Section 1 should be followed first. And if you cannot follow that guidance, then throw this. There's going to be situations even in Section 2 where you won't comply or you won't, you won't comply with the guidance. That's fine. But we have to come together as a consensus between the design team and the building control authority to, de to, to determine what is adequate, what is reasonable. Okay. So if Section 2 is referenced for whatever reason, we need very clear particular information as to why. It can't be a, 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 a open book, okay? So if the accessible entrance door cannot comply with Section 1.2, and you just tell me that the accessible entrance door will comply with 2.2.4, what exactly can comply? Is it that you can't put a vision panel on it? Is it that the ironmongery can't be upgraded? Is it that it's not the right width? If I don't know, I can't make a decision on it. So just be, be very clear as to what can't be made work and why. Um, must very clearly demonstrate what is not what is not practicable. I, I'm not a big fan of that word because people just tell me that, oh, the accessible entrance door cannot be upgraded. It's not practicable. Why? Why is the key word? I, the building control authority and any building control officer, they have to have clear details to make informed decisions. We can't just give carte blanche for everything. Uh, Ono Dowd referenced Article 9 of the Building Regulations SI number 497 of 1997 previously, and I want to reiterate it again for existing buildings. No works shall be carried out to a building which will cause a new or greater contravention in the building of any provision of these regulations. Don't make the situation worse. If we can leave it in a better state than when we found it, you know, we've done our job. Okay. What people often forget with regards to the newer greater contravention as well is the numbers of people that might be expected to use a building. So if you have a material change of use from an office to a cafe or a, a restaurant, and you've now trebled the occupancy in that building, have you created a greater contravention of part M? Kind of have, because you have a bit larger risk now of more people using that building. So something that's now wrong is going to need a little bit more attention to get right. Um, this is another bugbear of mine, and Connor and Ferris mentioned a number of bugbears for uh, building control uh, officers earlier, but internal layouts. If you have a blank canvas of an existing building, and we often see this of boom time buildings where the retail space or the shop space, uh, whatever it was to be on the ground floor, has been left vacant for years. There's apartments upstairs, and now this is starting to be fitted out. There is absolutely no reason why that internal layout cannot comply with Section 1 of TGDM. It's poor design uh, principles if, if we can't make that comply. The only items of, 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 of that building that, that could be allowed to be in accordance with Section 2 could be the entrance doors or the approach routes to an extent. But again, I need particular details. I need to know why it can't comply. Okay, But internal layouts, when you have a blank canvas, default should be to Section 1 straight away. Extensions uh, throw up their own kind of, I suppose, anomalies when it comes to interacting with existing buildings and how they function with the building itself. It's very important when you're looking at uh, or, or, or either designing or reviewing or assessing a design where you have an extension onto a building that you look at the interaction with the existing building and the environs around it, that you don't just treat the extension as this add-on piece that doesn't really that, that is supposed to function on its own okay and i'll show that a little bit further in, a, in another one there with regards to toilets but if we provide an extension to a building we cannot create a newer greater contravention to the existing building by providing that extension we can't make the situation worse so if we had uh let's say we had a bay 
of accessible or designated parking spaces here. And we've now shoved them further out. We theoretically created a greater contravention on this. We have an accessible entrance through here to make it better to get back into the existing building. Items like that, they have to be teased out, okay? The extension itself, we have to look at the approach and the access routes. So M2 of the building regulations will tell us that you have to have adequate access routes to an extension. You've kind of got two options, really. You either provide an adequate access and uh, route through the existing building to access the extension, or you provide adequate accessible entrances to the extension itself to comply. But you have to provide details on practicability if that is going to be the case. Um, this was a historic kind of town center building. I, I, the DAC I'd done in the last few years. Um, again, historic buildings would throw up, and I'm sure Nick, you would, we, we'll talk about that later on after me. Uh, a lot of kind of gremlins when it comes to trying to make design work. So in this situation here, we had straight off the, the public footpath into a kind of a up a slight ramp onto a perfectly fine landing. You turn left to go into the restaurant here. Uh, up a set of steps that were upgraded or if you want to go around to the back of the restaurant up here you have to go up a one and 13 slope but that one and 13 slope was existing it was a concrete ground floor we weren't going to be asking her to kangle that out and you couldn't really do it um it went up couldn't provide a landing at the top for the way the slope worked there was an existing wall here providing protection to the stairs which exited out that way so we had a fire door um we couldn't provide a landing we couldn't really provide guarding there so what we provide what we went with was doors on electromagnetic hold open devices satisfied the fire sort because it was linked back to the fire detection alarm system they'd fail safe open upon activation of the alarm and it protected the stairs uh, but from the part m aspect it kept me it gave me a clear route so my landing now moved up here to beyond the door it's just it's it's design features like that we have to use a bit of creativity a bit of out of the box thinking sometimes to make these buildings work as opposed to applying for a dispensation from part m1 for the entirety of the building for whatever reason Another one here for a, it was a material change use uh, from offices to a medical center. Another fire door that was required to protect the stairs that was further up here. Corridors were below 1100 mil, had to put in a fire door, couldn't get the leading edge on the fire door. Uh, and, and the corridors were obviously below 1200 mil as well. So similarly, again, we put the fire door on an electromagnetic hold open device, free flow in through there, made the door a little bit wider than it had to be, made it 900 mil wide to ease the circulation. But we're trying to break down the barriers to circulation here. We're not trying to create them by, by that. So Ona Dow talked about, the, I suppose, the building regulations working harmoniously together. And that's where good design has to come in as well, that we think about all these things together. As I said, I kind of have two slides here on existing stairs because they're ones that really seem to upset both designers and, and building control officers sometimes in, in what we can actually do with them, okay? So existing stairs to first floors, this is very much prevalent when we're trying to bring back above uh, the shop kind of accommodation in town centers, whether it be for commercial use or flats or whatever it is, okay? There's a number of non-compliant features in that particular uh, picture there. The one good thing is he actually has color contrasting nosings. Uh, carpet gave me a headache as soon as I saw it. But uh, what, what what options do we have? Do we just stop the development and say, no, sorry, it doesn't comply with part M as far as, you're, as, as we're concerned. Sorry, it doesn't comply with the guidance of uh, Tech and Guidance document M. So do we just stop the development? Or do we apply for a dispensation from that, from that area or relaxation of um, part M where it's inadequate? Or do we handle it through a DAC process and come to an agreement on what is adequate under the circumstances so that we can bring this building back into use? So how do we make the situation better? We can upgrade the surface of the stairs. We can take off the ugly carpet, which has got very bad patterns on it for someone who has visual impairment. We can put on a nice, simple, simple surface that's slip resistance. We can upgrade the handrail, possibly even provide two either side if we have the width. The, to make it compliant. We can add color contrasting nosings. We can improve the lighting levels to at least 100 lux. We could consider it acceptable with based on the new occupancy. So again, what's the building going to be used for? Could we live with the occupancy that's going to be up there? It's about making kind of judgment calls a lot of the time with existing buildings. Uh, you know, we could consider the rise and going acceptable if we upgraded all that. Because ask yourself the question, is there any new or great contravention of part M by what we've done? Have we made the situation worse or have we made it better? Made it better, so. Um, toilets, another one that, that tend to throw up some uh, 
gremlins as well. So if you've got an existing building that's to be extended. So in this case here, it was a school that had a small staff room extension and a small office extension. Under the guise of M2 or M3, I should say, uh, if sanitary facilities are to provide in a building that is to be extended, adequate sanitary facilities shall be provided for people within the extension. Now, given the size of this extension and the fact that really all they were doing was um, creating larger toilets there, it seemed a bit ridiculous to be asking them for a full Diagram 15 compliant toilet within that extension. The other side of it as well is who's it going to really serve? Just the staff, you know? But the extension was too small to justify a, a, a Diagram 15 WC. So we have options. We can insist on a Diagram 15 WC that goes in and it kind of renders the whole extension unusable. We could dispense with the requirement of M3 or we could agree a level of compliance that is adequate. So in this situation here, in this school, there was an existing Part M2000 toilet that was put in donkeys years ago, had a lobby onto it and everything. But there was no reason why we couldn't look at that as part of this application to kind of compensate for the fact that we couldn't put a, a Diagram 15 into the extension. Could we upgrade that to be compliant? Sure can. So that was our existing lobby on the left. And that's our compliant 15A toilet there on the right. Change, change, put, construct a new partition, knock a few walls there quite easily, a little bit of extra plumbing and a bit, of, a bit of grab rails, and we've upgraded the WC insofar as it is practicable. But what we've done now is we've benefited the entire school by what we've done. Um, with regards to upgrading an existing WC, people can kind of get lost in the, the, the can, can kind of see the, the wood from the trees sometimes when, when you're looking at the actual details of upgrading an existing WC. Like, what can you do? You see there in the first image, very poor color contrasting grab rails and fittings and no alarm pull cord. Second image, color contrasting grab rails, color contrasting fittings and fixtures, a proper alarm pull cord, you know. So we could rehang the door to swing outward if it's safe to do so, considering where the door is going to swing into access routes and things like that. If it is, we, we, we can look at other alternatives. We could replace the grab rails and fixtures if they're not color contrasting. We could fix the alarm pull cord because majority of the time it's either put in the wrong position or it's not provided at all. We can improve the lighting levels. We can improve the slip resistance of the floors. And I'll go back to, have we made any new or greater contravention by doing that? No. Have we made the situation better? Yes. So we can now say that we have an adequate level of access and use. So pop quiz, take two. I'll leave you to it then. So again, small office building, two rooms upstairs, genuinely and for good reason, the stairs cannot provide 1200 mil width as per paragraph 1343A of TGDM. We only have 900 mil. I think you all kind of know the answer now. We can handle it through the DAC process. So just to summarize what we kind of walk through there. So dispensations are from the regulations or the requirements of the regulations. They are not from the guidance. The idea behind the technical guidance documents is to give you a route of prima facie compliance or compliance on the face of it with the building regulations. But there are alternative approaches. You just have to tell us what you're doing or how you're doing it. It'll be the building control authority's ultimate decision as to how it works and whether it's whether it's whether we can certify it or not. Uh, building control circular 02 of 1992. It's a fantastic document. It doesn't just talk through dispensations and relaxations. It actually talks through the entire building control process and the idea behind the building regulations. Very very well written, well worthwhile um, 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 uh, reviewing it. But I'll just take that quote again from it. It would make little sense to relax a requirement to something which is less than reasonable, adequate, or necessary. We could see from the dispensations that have been applied for and granted over the last two years that Part M is being treated far differently than any other building regulation. We have to get it out of our mind that Part M is for people with disabilities. It's not. It's for people. So just bear that in mind the next time you're either designing for a disability access or, or you're assessing one. Existing buildings are challenging. There's no doubt about that, but that's, that's where designers, I think, you know, really excel. Bit of creativity, bit of professional judgment, some compensating features, and you can come to an agreement on what is adequate. Okay. And just to remind again, M1, adequate provision shall be made for people to access and use a building, its facilities and environments. So thank you very much.